All right. All right, there we go. So we have officially started our recording and we're gonna give people a few more minutes to come in. We had about a hundred people who registered for tonight. So, and for those of you who, those, of, those people who couldn't make it, we're gonna record it. So we'll post it on YouTube. We had 80 people look at the last one. I can't believe they watched the whole two hours, but maybe they did. Um, <clears throat> Tonight, we're really excited to have two experts talking about placemaking and John Kalitsky, who's helped us organize all this is gonna lead us off in a few minutes. Um, when we get a conversation going about what is placemaking and then we'll hear from our experts and what would apply to Larchmont. So we've got about 38 participants. So we might get a few more people, but what do you say, John? Shall we go ahead and we'll start with introduction? I'm always a great believer in waiting till 7.05. 7.05. 7.05, we start no matter what. All right, all right. I mean, the interesting thing about Zoom is in these types of meetings in the real world, when people are physically arriving, you tend to wait 15 min minutes. Oh, yeah, easy. Hour. Easy 15 minutes, right? Yeah, so, but Zoom does not give you that Los Angeles laissez-faire in, in the same degree that real life does. So we'll, we'll start in another 30 seconds or so. Yeah, there we go. Well, it's great to have everybody with us. We really appreciate your interest in the topic and spending some time with us on it and being part of our Larchmont community. I'm Patty Lombard and joined with three other organizers, Gary Gilbert, John Klitsky, and Heather Boylston. And we're gonna do official introductions. And we can start. In a minute. Okay, John. So John's gonna screen share. And if you want, you can keep your, um, your view on speaker or gallery. Gallery will let you see us all along the side. Um, and see the speaker, or you'll just see the presentation. So this is our second conversation, and we're really happy to have you here. The first one was on retail um, futures, and this one is um, on placemaking. I'm Patty Lombard. I am the co-publisher with Liz Fuller of the Larchmont Buzz, so I'm, and I'm wearing a second hat tonight, which is also a member of the Larchmont Boulevard Association which is comprised of the businesses um, on the street. And I think I'd like to turn it over to Heather to do her introduction. <laughs> Hi, I'm Heather Boylston and I'm a longtime resident of Larchmont. And I also work with the Larchmont Business Improvement <coughs> District, which is the property owners on Larchmont. And we're just happy to be a part of this process in concert with the merchants and the community um, and the neighborhood organization. Gary Gilbert. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Gary Gilbert, also a longtime resident. We all four of us are. I'm representing the residents of Windsor Square and beyond. And like you, I'm here tonight to listen and to learn. So when we get together as a community, we can make informed decisions as to what's best for the future of Larchmont. And I'm really looking forward to tonight because this is all new to me and incredibly interesting. John. Great. Sure. So I'm John Kaliski. I'm an architect and urban designer. Um, Patty and I originally got together on this subject, I think like seven or eight years ago, and we've been working on and off on it ever since. And so I was really excited when she called me up and asked me to join the effort. Um, I run an architecture and urban design firm here in Los Angeles in the historic Wiltern building. I'm also a member of the Country Club Park, Oxford Square, uh, Wilshire Park, Windsor Village, HPOZ, and I've lived in Windsor Village just south of Windsor Square for 35 years. So we're all here tonight to talk about placemaking. And in terms of tonight's agenda, we are going to review again what our goals and objectives are for these Larchmont 2021 conversations. We're going to do a short recap of our July 28th meeting on retail trends because we're assuming that not everybody was here and we wanna keep everybody sort of on the same uh, pathway in terms of hearing what we've heard. 
Um, we'll do a very short introduction to placemaking 101, just try to define what we're talking about because it's kind of a buzzword. We'll stop and pause for some questions and comments if there are any. Uh, Gary and Heather will field those and, and we'll try our best to answer them. Um, if after five or so, 10 minutes at the most, we still have questions, we'll defer them and move into our speaker presentations. We have two wonderful placemakers or place shakers, I think is the word we want to use tonight, who have joined us, Howard Blackson from San Diego and Lindsay Wallace, who I think is in Chicago. Is that correct, Lindsay? Yes, she's nodding her head. I can see that. So she's joined us very, very late at night, and we appreciate that. We'll then have a very short moderated discussion after their presentations on placemaking, which I'll ask them a few directed questions. I'll try to take good notes and then we'll open it up to everybody. And then we'll talk about next steps and where we're going with these conversations. Um, in terms of meeting considerations, we want this to be as open a meeting as possible. We know there are lots of creative and even different opinions in the community about what's best for Larchmont Village and the street and the surrounds, but we're at the very beginning of a process. These are listening sessions. We've set it up like that on purpose because I think just like you, we have our opinions too, but we thought it was important to get some perspectives from the outside before we started pulling ideas together. One thing that's important for the four of us at least is that we're very, very focused on short-term steps that can be taken. We're very interested in the midterm and the long-term steps as well, but in some ways you will find there's a little bit of a bias on Patty's, Gary's and Heather and my part in terms of trying to figure out what can we do now that, that could make good, positive uh, changes to the street. Um, we're looking forward to the input, but if you are not that comfortable participating in this type of a forum, it is a little bit of a new process. We do make mistakes. We nevertheless urge you to write Patty, patty at larchmontbuzz.com. We'll put that email up again during the course of the evening, but patty, at larchmontbuzz.com, send her a note. Um, if you're not that used to Zoom and you're wondering, um, how do I participate in the meeting? Well, what we'd like you to do is take a look at your chat button. Um, on a lot of the screens, it will appear at the bottom. Sometimes in Zoom, it appears to the side. If you hit that button, it will open up your chat box. You'll be able to type messages there at the bottom. Uh, if you leave it on to everyone, everyone will see your message. We hope everyone will see your message, but you could also, if you're a bit more familiar with the program, you can send it to an individual. But those, those uh, messages there should be questions or comments, and Gary and Heather will be fielding those. And when we get to our question and answer sessions, we will um, be working from those, at least at the beginning. Uh, we also, again, remind everybody, since there are stray dogs, children, fire engines, things of that nature, you might want to mute if you're not actually talking, and that would be really extremely helpful. So what are our goals and objectives for this meeting? Well, they're really not just for this meeting, but they're for our process as a whole. We're really interested in exploring means, especially short-term means, to support existing and foster new neighborhood-oriented retail and enhance Larchmont Village. Um, we have a lot of objectives. I think the key ones for these conversations is to learn about best Main Street and neighborhood retail and placemaking practices. In our first conversation two weeks ago, we concentrated on the neighborhood retail. Now we're concentrating on the placemaking. In some ways, they're one and the same. In other ways, they have different emphasis. We do want to collect improvement ideas. We are going to have an ideas workshop two weeks, I believe, from tonight. We'll talk about that later. But we want to hear what everybody's ideas are, and we want to collect as many of them as possible through this process. Ultimately, we'd like to develop a working consensus and some next steps that we could either bring to the council office or the local um, neighborhood council or the homeowners associations that surround the area to the Larchmont Boulevard Association, um, et cetera. 
so that we can actually see some of these ideas implemented. And most of all, we wanted to start and encourage a neighborhood dialogue and input regarding a sustainable future for Larchmont Village. So those are our goals and our objectives for the greater conversations. We started this process formally with our first meeting on July 28th, where we invited two retail experts to come and talk to us. Rob York is a retail expert who works with both the public sector and the private sector in the form of bids or business improvement districts. Uh, he, he made a presentation as did Andrew Thomas, who is the executive director of the Westwood Village Association, I believe it's called. Uh, Westwood is a lot larger than Larchmont, as he pointed out, but in some ways it presents many of the same challenges. So what did they basically tell us during uh, this session? Well, you can certainly go and watch the 80 minutes that um, Patty referred to, a lot of people have, which is really exciting. But what they really, we felt, told us was that there's a lot to work with in Larchmont. In many ways, we're a very fortunate community. We're less vulnerable than many retail streets because of our demographics, our position, our surrounds. But they did acknowledge that the rents are challenging for individual tenants. But interestingly enough, they said even with those challenging rents, which have gone up a lot in recent years, it does not preclude independents from coming in who have the right concept. But what is the right concept? Because retail has changed. They talked a lot about trends towards more food, beverage, and niche retailers. Um, in looking at the street, I think both of them made various comments about the buildings, the storefronts, the sidewalks, the lighting, the trees, some of the corner uses or the gateway conditions at First and at um, Beverly. And they kind of said it's okay, but not in great shape. It could certainly be improved. We might talk a little bit about that tonight. In terms of considerations, if not recommendations that they need, that they made, they talked a lot about being adaptable for flexibility and to be able to adapt quickly to nimbleness. And they talked a lot about the existing Q and D conditions, the regulations that shape a lot of the decisions that individual property owners and tenants make as needing to be put into the context of flexibility and nimbleness. They also said we should be on the lookout to both foster and encourage shorter leases for startups and pop-ups because that's a place where a lot of vital retail activity is taking, is, is moving. Um, they said we should consider fostering ride share on the street. Right now we, people come in and out, but there's no formal place for them to drop off. They were definitely supportive of the alfresco dining that has emerged on the street as the result of the pandemic. They both really talked a lot about various ways that independent businesses could be supported and needing to dig deeper into that. Um, there was a lot of conversation about Los Angeles's restaurant uh, beverage program, which is a new program where the city is looking to, in a regulated way with enforcement mechanisms, um, potentially um, facilitate the granting of certain types of alcohol permits. That's something that's in the city council or going to the city council right now. There was a lively conversation about the pluses and minuses of that, but I think both of them thought we should look at it seriously. But most of all, they said, because of the nature of the street, we should focus on local customers, uh, the restaurants, the retail, the neighborhood oriented retail and health, wellness and fitness uses that that seems to be a fit for the street and is where retail is going. Um, they also said that the idea that we're doing this in open and transparently they think is critical to the success of the street in the long run. And they suggested that we might at some point want to um, do some type of a survey to solicit even wider opinions and ideas. Like uh, Patty said, you can watch the entire presentation on YouTube. Um, we encourage you to do that. Placemaking, that's what we really want to talk about tonight. Um, what is placemaking? It's a kind of catch-all term. It sounds great. And in thinking about it, we realized ourselves that we were kind of pushing our own ideas about what it meant. And we wanted to try to universalize it a little bit for this conversation. So as an introduction, I'm going to present 
three quick slides with three overlapping definitions of placemaking. The first comes from MIT, their uh, Department of Urban Studies and Planning, a wonderful book that they produced in 2015 called Places in the Making, where in 80 pages, they kind of go through all the different methods. I think it's evolved since then, but I did really like this definition that they describe. Placemaking seeks to build or improve public space, spark public discourse, create beauty and delight, engender civic pride, connect neighborhoods, support community health and safety, grow social justice, catalyze economic development, promote environmental sustainability, and of course, nurture an authentic sense of place. I think we could all go through this list, every single item and talk about the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats in relationship to Larchmont for each of these. It's a lot to pick off, and I look forward to hearing how Howard and Lindsay, our guests tonight, do that in a bit. A perhaps a simpler definition is the one offered by Project for Public Spaces. Project for Public Spaces is one of the premier nonprofits that works with communities all over the country to promote placemaking, and they too connect it to the community and the voices in the community. Placemaking inspires people to collectively reimagine and reinvent public spaces as the heart of every community. We wanted to have these conversations because we felt that the really terrific volunteer efforts that have occurred in the past and are ongoing, some of which create events like the Larchmont Farmers Market on a weekly basis or annual events like Larchmont Family Fair, that's really where you see the street at its best and its, and its strength. And so we wanted to bring people together to talk about the future of the street. And the final definition comes from Jan Gell. Jan Gell is an urbanist and architect who's in Denmark, who has done a lot of work, interestingly enough, in Los Angeles. He was involved in the Figueroa Street improvements. He's done a lot of work in West Hollywood. And he has a very simple quote which kind of brings it all together, at least for me, which is first life, then spaces, then buildings. The other way around never works. So we have fantastic opportunities on Larchmont to make a place because all the ingredients are there. But in the end, it's kind of up to us to come together and make it. And that's why we're having these conversations. So that's really the introduction for tonight. And before we get into the presentations, I'm just wondering, um, Gary and Heather, whether there are any um, comments or questions that we can answer about our goals, our objectives, placemaking, what we've already accomplished in terms of our retail trends conversation or anything. If you feel this is a great moment to put it on the table before we go into the weeds on place. We don't have any questions or comments yet. That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, well, then maybe what we should do is, since everybody seems to be comfortable, um, why don't we go ahead and proceed into the presentations and I'll introduce our first speaker and then he has a short presentation which he's brought for us this evening. Our first presenter is Howard Blackson. Uh, Howard Blackson wears many, many hats. Uh, he just waved. On, I, you might be able to see him, but when we start, you'll definitely be able to see him. He's been a a long-term principal at a place called Placemakers LLC. They've worked on a lot of projects. Um, even though Howard has worked all over the world, I became aware of him through his work in San Diego. In San Diego, at one time, he worked for the city at the Civic Innovation Lab. He was the program manager there. If you like haunt the neighborhoods of, of San Diego, there's a lot of great main streets in San Diego that seem to fit the bill for the type of quality of life that one might aspire to in this type of work. He's also been a lecturer at the New School, UC San Diego, Woodbury, many other places. Um, you can catch his blog at howardblackson.com. He's a great Twitter um, shaker, which I enjoy his, his tweets. And one of the things that I like about him is that he said, aspiring towards equilibrium or harmony is the most appropriate urban design response for a neighborhood to achieve its equity environmental and economic sustainability goals. So I presented Howard a few weeks ago, but I'll represent it for all of us again. And it's the same challenge for Lindsay in a few minutes. 
three basic questions that I felt might be a way for him to frame his contribution to our conversation tonight. And the first one is what impacts neighborhood placemaking now? What are people thinking about? What do we need to be thinking about? Um, what is affecting streets and is making them successful or not so? A second one is what placemaking trends are shaping successful main streets, not only now, but in the future? And finally, I know Howard had a daughter who lived up here who he helped move back to San Diego a month or so ago. And I know that when he was up here, he visited Larchmont. So having visited and considered Larchmont, what are your placemaking takeaways about the street? So with that, I'll turn it over to Howard. Howard, just tell me when you want me to flip your slides and I will do so. Great, uh, thank you very much, I appreciate it. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. Uh, having John Kaliski as part of your group is, is a, real, a, a real value. And, um, um, and I appreciate um, having this time to talk uh, because I'm sure the work that's being done is, is very thoughtful and going to uh, produce the outcomes that, uh, you know, that make a big difference. Um, the thing I wanted to talk about, sort of this, you know, what's happening now, what do you see uh, going on and how do you project it into large amount of the future, is the is the idea, you know, we've been talking about mixed use walkable urbanism now for the buildings and the private land for the past 10 years plus, and now it's time to talk about mixed use streets. I think you all are right in the midst, in the, in the middle of, of um, the tension and the trade-offs between this very narrow thoroughfare and the things that you can do to it from the past, today, and into the future. And uh, uh, this is uh, NACTO, the National Association of Transportation, oh gosh, people, organization. Um, they, um, NACTO has a, a, a wonderful list of books. Um, and the most recent is one of them is curbside management. And the, the number of uses that are going on at the curbside is, is, is increased in amazingly since uh, um, in the last 10 years, since COVID really. The bike share, the food trucks, the parklets, the loading zone, the drop-offs, the, um, oh, thank you for posting that, Lindsay, the drop-offs, the pickups, the Uber, the Lyfts, and the Amazons. Um, uh, 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 transit access, um, paratransit access, metered parking, uh, bus stops. It's all going on right now, every block along the way. Next, please. And, and during COVID, we all experienced this, this street in a completely different way. It was a street, the street was, um, we always had had curbside, um, cafe, sidewalk, um, curbside encroachments on the, ca on the streetscape. Um, but now we started doing parklets and then we've done curb extensions and new and old. And then we've even done full block shutdowns. And so these were all done under emergency circumstances so that the businesses could, be, could do their business outside. And we wanted to be outside. And also we started walking around and exercising and recreating and getting out of our house um, uh, uh, using our streets and our main street. So the main street and the outdoors and the streetscape from the front of the building to the center line really changed uh, the, uh, the past year over COVID and the, our response to it. And now we're trying to come out of the emergency and into what's the long-term meaning. Next. We've conventionally looked at streets as car parking and traffic lanes only. Well, there's some loading and there is this and there's bus stops, and there's walkways and we've tolerated a few bicycles here and there. But the conventional way of looking at the street is it was car dominate. And, and we know that that now is being, is being pushed in, into the center of the street where the cars and the thoroughfares are moving right in the center and we're starting to transition to the different uses that are along the buildings and the frontage, which most of Larchmont is, is Larchmont's a very interesting street to me because uh, the north end is a, is a, is a, has a completely different context and feel than, than the south end. And there's a few blocks that are very, very urban and, and hustling and bustling and thriving and, re, and shop um, uh, dining and uh, retail. And, and it changes, it changes character as you move north next. But we didn't ever take these character into account. What we always, what we've been doing lately is looking at the street by speed. The areas next to the curb, the furnishing layer, the walkway, the encroachment layer, 
the when you're sitting and dining, it's a zero miles per hour. When you're walking, there's about a four to eight miles an hour. Then the then there's the street trees and the and the parking meters and the lighting, and then there's the curb where there's the drop off and stopping, which are very very low speed. And then you have your cycling lane or your transit lane, and then your thoroughfare lane, which gets faster and faster. Um, so we've been looking at the street in terms of of traffic and speed and the layers of those of those um, of those um, uh, speed modes. Next, um, we're also looking at that. Now we're looking at streets as commercial. Uh, lower left hand is in uh, Detroit. The upper right hand is in uh, Tokyo. And the issue is, is that we're using streets for commerce. We, you, you all have a, a farmer's market where you, uh, uh, you take over a, a, a weekend parking lot. You have a family fair, uh, which is a, more of a festival, but there's shopping and things where you close the whole street down. Uh, there's places that you have uh, that we're, we're putting the, the food trucks, where they're putting the uh, concert venues in the middle of the street, as you see on the left. So the commercial uses are definitely have been reimagined and creeping out into the street, even deeper into the thoroughfare where we have the parklets and we have uh, the food trucks and in, in the parking uh, layer in that layer of just before you get to the travel layer. Next. We're also doing a lot of recreational uses where the parklets are supposed to be public spaces. You have parkways. It's a new parkway in San Diego in front of a grocery store. Um, we have uh, shutting down full streets where we have plazas that are intended to, you know, hang out and spend some time and spend some money. Um, the recreational uses of the street mean a public use, and these are a natural fit as well between commerce public space and then how much of it is going to be a uh, public use and how much is it going to be a uh, shop uh, and com commercial use next. And the next phase, in, in my opinion, is going to be using um, uh, the street for uh, working and living. Uh, this is uh, images from are from Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong in the past where you had the arcade where the building above the walkway and above the you know, the, 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 the um, sidewalk cafe is actually has offices and housing and, and things above it encroaching into the street. And then this is a new uh, image of Hong Kong where the, the store is actually, in, you know, over the street, completely over the street. And so encroaching in on the street with living, with, uh, with working offices, hotels, um, maybe some sort of, and I know in Los Angeles, there was a, um, a homeless uh, pod that was being parked in uh, parking spaces to you know, add some privacy and some uh, sanitation to homeless. That, that, that idea is coming. That's the next step, the moving and encroaching over the street with private uses. Next. And then understanding that when you're looking at your main street, and this is what is a real current trend in the, in the world right now, which is called the Barcelona block, where Barcelona is taking its ubiquitous block scape and it's saying some there's going to be super blocks that have the complete streets, the main streets, the bus, the bike, and everything all at once. And then just on the same block around the corner, there's going to be a green street. And then the other block around the corner is going to be a shared street. And that it, the, each block could have up to three <clears throat> or two or three different streetscapes on that individual block with the main street staying as the main street. You all have that opportunity as well. And it's the idea of designing the main street beyond main street, but looking at it in the scale of the neighborhood. And, and next. And when you look at it in the scale of the neighborhood, then you see all of these types of, of, um, of uses of these mix of uses come out where you have the mobility speed and, and, and issue, the commercial, the live work, the recreational. And what's interesting is that our smartphone, this device here is every bit as powerful as the uh, internal combustion machine and the car motor was for uh, myself and, and my parents and my grandparents moving around the city. My kids and, and, and their kids, oh my gosh, not yet. My kids and, and the, the kids that are coming up right now are using this to get around the city. And it's, it's going to shape the, the spaces just as much next because the idea of looking at your neighborhood with a main street is that other these other uses are, are available to you around the street. Um, and then so my recommendations for looking into the future is plan, design, think at the neighborhood scale and, and move from a loss of parking on main street 
to a trade-off of, of, of managed parking in your neighborhood. You also use the idea of parking as a walk shed. How far, you, it's not a park right in front, it's a park, it's a, a, a walking to a park once and walking to certain areas and certain areas have different uses along the street. Also uh, design and plan in terms of time. Your farmer's market is a different time frame than your uh, family fair, which is different from the drop off and uh, the parking, uh, short term parking of a car in front today. Manage it in, in, in your street layers in terms of, of time rather than speed, because spending time means spending money. And then spending money is economic development. And then use your off street parking at certain times. It's not all the time. Uh, use your curbside management at specific times. And then finally, just we have to change our very, very selfish first come first serve attitude for parking. Me first is really not, is really something we've learned to, um, to uh, uh, modify in the COVID response. We, we, we all know that we're all in this together. We're all connected and we have a, a, um, the ability to, um, to shape and change our streetscape by looking at, by changing our attitude about first come first serve. And that is my presentation formally, but I would like to say one thing. Um, my, another quote I have that was reminded by the young Gale quote was, when I say building for social and cultural value, always equates to economic value. When you build for something that really fits with your, your culture, really fits with your society expectations and, and memories, you get economic development, but the converse is not as true. If you build for economic development, you don't always get social and cultural value. So I say, put the social and cultural first, and that's really the part of placemaking that's important because you really saw a whole lot of community um, action because really placemaking is kind of a, do it yourself urbanism or planning by doing or urban acupuncture and you're, you're, you're testing, you're incubating and you're not spending all your money at one time to do this one thing. And if it doesn't work, then boom, it, it devastates the area. Be flexible and test things out and try things and see what sticks because that fits your culture better than this one-off uh, uh, big pie in the sky project. That's my presentation. Well, that, that was fantastic. I, I've got 10,000 questions for you, but I'm going to hold off because I think we're going to get a potpourri of additional ideas to react to and from our second presenter, who is Lindsay Wallace. Um, Lindsay Wallace is the Director of Strategic Projects and Design Services at Main Street America, really one of the premier, if not the premier organization that looks at these issues uh, throughout the United States and even beyond, I think a little bit, they've done some things. Um, Main Street America is an offshoot or is in some ways maybe a program of the National Main Street Center, which itself is an offshoot of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So we're really excited that Lindsay's here tonight. Amongst the things that she does is she manages the National Park Service or a component of the National Park Service's Main Street Facade Improvement Program. She's been involved in Historic Commercial District Revolving Fund Loan Programs. Uh, she teaches advanced principles of quality design through the Main Street America Institute. Um, the in, their mission at Main Street America is to revitalize older and historic commercial districts to build vibrant neighborhoods and thriving economies. And she's been involved with many really super interesting programs. And, and, and we're excited um, to have Lindsay here and, and give us some thoughts. So with that, I'll um, put your first slide on, Lindsay. Is that, are you with us? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, your sound sounds is good. Yeah. Fantastic. All good. No, thank uh, you so, so much. So Lindsay, again, though, before I put that first slide, just to remind what we're trying to do is what do you think is impacting neighborhood placemaking now? what placemaking trends shape successful main streets in the future and having visited and considered Larchmont, well, you didn't visit um, Larchmont, but I will say we spent an hour with you, Patty and I, walking up and down the street, FaceTiming Larchmont with you, which in COVID times was one of the more interesting exercises that I've done. You had a ton of questions and great observations when we were doing that. So having considered Larchmont, what are your placemaking takeaways? And with that, I will um, go on to your next slide. 
Sounds great. Thanks, John. And thanks for the invitation. It's it's just a pleasure to be here with you all. I am in Chicago, but I did have the pleasure of going on a FaceTime tour. And I can tell just from that, that you are in a really special place that has a lot of opportunity and potential. And I think this is just the right conversation to be talking through. Um, so this basically repeats what John had said. So that's me. John, if you don't mind advancing, please. Just to give you a bit of a uh, setting the stage about Main Street America, just so you can understand like where I'm coming from and framing these remarks. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that started in 1980. We started as a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, but we focus in commercial districts across the country. We work in rural, suburban, and urban places, working about 1,800 communities across the country since 1980. Uh, we are our own um, nonprofit. We spun off as a subsidiary. And 2013. So we're kind of on our own now, but still with a close relationship with the National Trust. And we still have historic preservation as a lens through which we look at economic development. So Howard, I think, pulled out like one of the, the best ways to describe this kind of economic development in that we really focus on place-based community-led economic development. We're not just about economic development. We're about all of these other pieces that are just as important as the financial piece in making sure a commercial district is sustainable. Uh, next slide, please. And we're in uh, you know, economic development circles, we tend to be known for the four point approach, which we've rebranded as a Main Street approach because we wanted to de-silo the concept, but essentially our work is comprehensive or, uh, over a few silos here. Uh, economic vitality obviously is, is at the core, but design, we look at how design uh, plays a crucial role in supporting sustainable economic development, so supporting the community um, in promotions so looking at unique assets in a, in a district so that they can leverage them for that sustainable economic development. And of course, organization, thinking about, um, you know, partnerships and, and volunteerism and those kinds of things to make sure that any sort of economic development effort is community led. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about placemaking, the reason that um, John reached out to me and another colleague to be on this presentation is this is really the area in which you know I deliver a lot of presentations around placemaking, around design, historic preservation. Um, and right now we're doing a lot of work around what are called entrepreneurial ecosystems, which are essentially support networks for existing businesses and new entrepreneurs, right? And what we found in a lot of traditional definitions of these ecosystems systems is that they're generally missing this concept of physical environment and place and how place and physical space and public spaces can support the, um, the long-term economic sustainability. Next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, I think Howard touched on this, but, you know, we are, of course, in the middle of this COVID recovery period, hopefully, fully recovery period. Um, and we do a lot of research at Main Street America on commercial districts across the country, again, urban and rural, looking at how people have um, endeavored to recover, what kinds of strategies they've taken up. And we really are seeing the kinds of placemaking initiatives people have been pushing for, for for decades at this point actually being iterated right across the country in small communities in neighborhood commercial districts so it's a really exciting time for the place making movement if you will but also for like just exploring strategies um, but what's interesting too about this is that as we've it, you know put forward different efforts and focused on place making and iterated these different kinds of um, strategies, people have gotten used to it, right? So in a lot of the research that we've done, and this is a blog that my um, my colleague posted, I'll, I'll post the link in the chat in a bit, uh, basically looking at a bunch of different surveys, a bunch of different reports about recovery behavior, and that they found that consumers have adapted to this kind of behavior, expecting, you know, delivery options, curbside options, outdoor dining, you know, these kinds of things. And businesses really need to pivot because that pivot the pivot of the commercial or the uh, consumer behavior isn't going away. So there's a real opportunity to um, codify these kind of placemaking strategies that people experimented with in this COVID recovery period. Next slide, please. And I'm really glad Howard talked about streets because I, I didn't, I'm not spending much time on it, unfortunately. Um, oh, oh. It's just right here. 
kidding. It's just my kidding. Don't you worry. I know you got the bite in you. I got choppers. Okay, so we obviously <laughs> yeah, have is it? somebody. <laughs> I didn't know if it was just me. Mute their microphone because Lindsay, that's not your family doing that, right? <laughs> no, okay. no, but it sounds okay. like fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so just yeah. No, thanks to Howard for looking looking in more detail at streets because that is something you know I think that relates definitely to what you're working with in Larchmont and thinking about your street as a public space, right? This chart here that I pulled out. This was a, a resource that we worked on with Project for Public Spaces last year um, called Navigating Main Streets as Places. And we really were looking at streets as places and people first design, right? So when you're focused on a person's experience of a community, a commercial district, that streets that supports, you know, a bunch of different things. And this, I'm not going to get into all of these, but this um, report or this um, handbook that we wrote focuses on the various ways that people for streets benefit the community, right? So in different ways that supports equity, safety, of course, health of the community, environmental sustainability, economic vitality, which I think Howard said, you know, time is money, right? And if people are there longer, you might um, walk around, shop, eat, uh, and then the sense of community. So when we put community there, we're talking about the sense of community, sense of place. And people for streets really, really do do that. So this I just highlighted because, you know, I think in these discussions, as you're thinking about what you want to do in Larchmont, having data to support this stuff, having reports to look at, to sort of reference these impacts, this is important. So I wanted to point this out because we do in, a, in the first chunk of this handbook really spend a lot of time on some academic resources on how people first streets benefit these uh, specific buckets. Next slide, please. And so getting back to that idea of pivoting, right? I know that um, through my tour of Larchmont, I know that you all have been experimenting with outdoor dining and that of course, um, in a lot of ways came out of necessity, right? But we're in this opportunity phase of looking at what kinds of, uh, opportunities these iterations do present, right? Are there opportunities to make parklets and pedlets permanent, right? So a few um, a few benefits here. This was from an effort we worked on with AARP Livable Communities, who they're they're also place making experts. They they do such amazing work. I highly recommend. We did a series of design briefs on specific place making interventions that can help support. The community, but also economic vitality. And with parklets and pedlets, I mean, this would come as no surprise, but I think, you know, the economic impact, we understand why, especially, um, you know, people endeavored to do parklets during the COVID recovery. But I think this community building piece is also important and something to think about where you have, especially as people aren't totally ready to go back indoors, aren't totally ready to go back to normal, whatever that is, or they've pivoted their behavior and, and would prefer to be outside, you can look at these kinds of public space interventions as opportunities for community building, for social gathering, for social cohesion and ownership of public space. I mean, re-looking at public space and thinking about, you know, this parking space, yes, that does belong to the community, but could it also be, you know, a seating area? I know you're experimenting or have been for months on those kind of things so far, um, but also this opportunity to create hyper local amenities right that reflect your local interest and culture so this just I wanted to throw this up here as a benefit for parklets uh, and pedlets which i'll show you a photo of that. Um, as kind of a permanent infrastructure, not just you know a COVID recovery response next slide please. So I wanted to show a couple of examples because I think, um, you know, when we talk about what challenges are, is like neighborhood place making facing right now. And I think parking is, is a huge one. You know, it seems like um, anytime I talk about any of these kind of, especially street interventions, like parking can be contentious. Cause I, you know, you understand it. People want a convenient way to be downtown. They want a convenient way to access the commercial district. However, these things can work in balance, right? So I wanted to show you a couple of examples um, just to show that parklets can be, you know, different configurations too. Uh, and also I should point out, you know, parklets are a concept that has been around for, I don't know, maybe 15 years at this point. And, and San Francisco is actually the, the kind of birth, well, one of the birthplaces of it. So you have really good examples for San Francisco on this too. But I wanted to show you that, you know, in this time of COVID-19 recovery, parklets are everywhere. So people are iterating everywhere in all kinds of spaces, big and small. This is in San Marcos, Texas, which is not a super small community, but not a huge community either. Um, and they, 
they did a really interesting thing where they already had a parklet program, but then in during uh, summer of 2020, they decided to expand it and they created a temporary parklet manual with the help of some pro bono services of uh, local designers to help with that. And so this was just one example where they had, you know, a wide sidewalk. So they decided to make this kind of this Korean restaurant made kind of a small parklet but not really a parklet because it's not in a parking space. But I thought it was an interesting, you know, just illustration of the kinds of different things you can do. And next slide, please. Um, and when I mentioned pedlets, this is something a lot of you may have heard of. Some of you may, you know, may have not yet. But this is something that um, is an alternative to a parklet, and where you still are using a parking space, but instead of putting the seating out there, you're putting the seating on the sidewalk, and the walking and the rolling is facilitated with this ramp that goes out into the parking space. And this is in Great Falls, Montana. It's a, a small, small-ish rural place. But one thing I wanted to point out that was so interesting about their program, this was a, um, a, a program that they started off with one parklet and they, it was, or pedlet, and it was something they worked on with one business owner and the city. The city decided, all right, you know what, we'll donate this parking spot for one year and you have to track the economic impact of that. And we're going to track how much revenue we lose from not having that parking spot. Turns out the ROI on giving up that parking space for the pedlet was higher than actual the parking costs back to the city. So the city helped them expand. They're now in several restaurants around the uh, around the city and in during COVID recovery or during last summer they got a ton of requests from other businesses trying to do the same thing so it's just that iteration right it just started with one parking space and some um, you know semi-permanent installations and from there it's, it's built out built out over the years next slide please and so when we talk about, you know, what, what are the opportunities in Larchmont, I think there are a lot, right? And when we're talking about what can you do now, um, I think, you know, you should really think about extending the life of those design strategies that you've all implemented as a result of COVID, right? The, again, we've kind of go back to this idea that, um, you know, COVID in some ways has given us this opportunity to iterate in a way that people might have been afraid to before, because it is scary to invest money, it is scary to iterate, it is scary that, uh, you know, the possibility of failing, whatever that looks like, right? But because we've been able to do this in this kind of um, recovery response way, now you have these spaces that you've already started iterating. So if you start to observe what's going on and talk to like I, I really liked John that idea from your past presenters about doing a community survey because you can kind of assess like do people really like this will they use this for other things right um, one thing that you know I think Howard brought up with parking that I know that parking is a major issue especially when you're talking about you know implementing or keeping some of these place making ideas permanent, there is a lot of public parking in your district, right? But I know that people avoid some of the parking lots because maybe the lighting is, isn't is super safe or, you know, folks, the, the perception of that kind of safety is, is really crucial. So I would, you know, recommend, you know, one thing is looking at a clean and safe program where it isn't that your district is unsafe or unclean, not at all, just that there's some lighting kind of options in that where if you took what you have already with this parking opportunity, but, you know, installed some lights or worked with the property owner to do that, you may have some opportunities then to free up your parking spaces elsewhere. And it would mean revenue for the, the property owner, which, you know, of course, that would probably be of interest. Um, another thing that we talked about during the walk was legacy businesses, right? Like Larchmont has several really great decades old businesses that you don't want to lose. I mean, it's hard, obviously, with um, commercial gentrification and rising rents and all of that. But I think, uh, you know, there are there is precedent for legacy business ordinances in, in communities that are experiencing kind of a big shift in uh, in real estate in Seattle, San Francisco, just to name a few, but there are others. And I think that could be a short term strategy and kind of researching what those look like and what they could look like in in Larchmont. I would imagine, you know, there are plenty of people in LA who've already started looking into this, but it would uh, could be a, a short term goal to kind of get with them and start to partner on, on those concepts. Um, and Lynn, just quickly, a couple of designy type things, you know, it, it never hurts to do a building inventory and accessibility assessment. You have a beautiful street, but we know that those tree roots have have kind of messed up the sidewalks a little bit, it might help to do an accessibility assessment where you go 
down the street and kind of look at spaces where if you were in a wheelchair, if you were using a wheelchair, would you be able to navigate that safely? If you were pushing a stroller, if you had a walker, just to kind of see, okay, look at that space in a different way and how might, you know, what, what might be the uh, solutions to that. And a building inventory is just good to, the, then you know, what spaces are open, what might be leased, what building owners may be interested in, in working on the kind of pop-ups that you know the, the folks that uh, presented last time had talked about, those kinds of co-location type spaces. And then just lastly, I would you know recommend considering storefront guidelines. And I'm not, I'm not saying that as I know there, there probably isn't a lot of interest in like a historic designation for the district. However, you could still develop these kind of design and storefront guidelines as best practices for guidance as a resource for those who are opening businesses or doing rehabilitations of the buildings downtown. Just a thought. Uh, next slide, please. I put this in here. I, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but I wanted to throw up some policies and incentives to consider too. And when we're talking about these short-term uh, options, it's just good to keep keep it in mind as, as opportunities to research, right? What kinds of incentives might be there for legacy businesses, for existing businesses, but also for potential new entrepreneurs, right? People who might want to iterate um, some kind of pop-up, but aren't ready to, to go into a full space. Um, so just some ideas there. And then of course, the legacy business ordinances. There's a resource here on the lower right from the um, I, it's the ILSR, it's the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. They're fantastic. They have a really great, um, basically, guidebook that kind of uh, gives you examples of all of these things over here, uh, policies and incentives to support small business during the pandemic and after. Uh, next slide, please. And the last thing I just wanted to say, to point out that, you know, placemaking has been, um, been happening for decades, right? And so there are a lot of really great resources out there. There, It may seem like some of these things are new or scary or like, well, how are we even going to do this? But there's a lot of precedent and a lot of good both studies on impact, but also just different kinds of strategies for different kinds of places. So just know there's a lot out there. I know NACTO, Howard mentioned, ARP Livable Communities. There's some really great resources out there that can help guide the process. So that's me for now. Fantastic. Well, you both have uh, raised a lot of interesting points. You pointed to other places where people have taken sort of proactive steps. And one of the questions I want to ask both of you is for a small street like Larchmont, which it, well, it's it's three blocks long, they're long blocks, but one of the blocks is decidedly residential and will remain so. The other block to the north, as has been mentioned, Howard, you mentioned it, is a, a somewhat different configuration. And then we get the 1200 feet of the village itself. But when you look at a, a street like that, what are the types of local tools or organizations that really run streets and take the lead? I mean, maybe what I'm really asking you both is what type of leadership models do you see that are successful on these streets that move things forward? What, what do we need to be thinking about? Are there new ideas there, old ideas? We have a bid, we have a property owners association. We seem to have a lot of organizations who care about the street, but we also seem to be trying to figure out a way to manage it. Because a lot of what you're talking about, both talking about is active management. So maybe one or both of you would love to comment on that. John, maybe we can also stop screen sharing and then we'll be able to see Lindsay and Howard Perfect. a little better. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I'll defer to Lindsay first because she works with those organizations. Thanks, Howard. Yeah, I, I was going to say Main Street organizations, John. I think, I mean, and I think oftentimes bids function that way. So it isn't that you're missing that. Um, but in terms of leadership, I think it's, it's a matter of deciding what you're going to do first and having a point person there and partners to support them. I think defining roles, defining governance of place, that term of place governance is important because then you know what you're responsible for and who's taking the lead. So I don't mean to put, you know, put it all on Heather with the bid, but you know, I think bids and, and organizations like that play such an important role because 
they're about creating those partnerships, um, supporting entrepreneurs, supporting small businesses, gaining that trust and building that those relationships, that um, that kind of leadership model, at least from, I mean, it's granted the network that I work in, right? Uh, but they tend to be the driving forces, both of actually implement, implementing projects, but getting people at the table, which, uh, you know, you're doing that tonight, so, yeah. Um, a couple yeah. points. Oh, Go ahead, Howard. Sure. Okay, a couple of points is that I think it's good to have multiple layers of, of oversight. Um, that, that, that makes for a better group think. It also makes decision, while it might be take more time, I think it's a smarter decision-making process and it helps protect things. And it kind of keeps you from doing one dumb thing that ruins everything. <clears throat> and then number two is um, the, the real issue you have is the trade-off between what the city public values, which is safety, and uh, access and what the what the private development and the private uh, entities value, which is commerce and you know speed, you know changeover and getting people in and out. So there's 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 a natural conflict between the public and private, um, and that's that's what you have to manage and negotiate. Um, one of the things though we're trying to put together here in San Diego with our economic development um, <clears throat> department is an enhanced PBID, where the PBID actually has some permitting and processing of, of the encroachment zone and the, sh and, the sh and, the, and the building frontage onto the street to generate more revenue um, and also to give more local um, 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 design um, um, uh, direction uh, uh, requirements, not, not so by just PBID, guidelines. By PBID, you mean a public um, business improvement district that yes. really rather than looking at the private property and the tenants interest is really out there looking at the public interest, which would be the sidewalks, the parking lot, the street, et cetera. That's right. And, and, um, and then having, um, having that in association with Heather's group and the bid itself, the private bid, so that you're able to, do, to make your um, design decisions that enhance you know, the, the, the character and the, and the um, outcomes of the street. Uh, so that's something that we're trying to put together because we see, because because the answer to your second question, what's really influencing things right now in in, in place making and building and especially anywhere in California, is affordable housing and transit oriented development coming from state law. The state is 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 going to make this happen, and that's an opportunity for mixed use and for for money and for um, transit money, mobility money affordable housing money that can come into your main street um, with, with a different set of tools. And that YIMBY sort of movement is what's making the most changes. And all of this at the state level is intended to uh, address climate change. And that's something that we have to do with tailpipes and mobility and, and thinking about how to use the streets and the curbs rather than just a place for cars to sit and drive to and idle and drive from. Yeah, that, that's a very good point because when you, I mean, I was going to ask you, how do you imagine you're going to pay for the PBID, but to a certain degree, you're going to link public benefits from new development back into the improvement of the public realm. Exactly, because it, right. and you get health, you get health benefits and there's health money out there. You can get mobility benefits. There's mobility transit money out there and you get the affordable, blah, blah, blah. It all, it all links together on your main street because your main street has everything. One of the things that I think was really interesting about your presentation, which, I mean, even as someone who, who does this, I, I think that you presented it extremely um, succinctly, was you talked a lot about sort of the pressure of new things encroaching into the curbside and, and the need to start reimagining the curbside in more and multiplicitous ways. And one of the things I'm, I'm wondering a little bit I'll ask both of you is two things. One is where do you start? And two is how do we think about our median out there in relationship to it? Because we do, you know, when the train was uh, there originally, there were two train tracks going up and down the street. The train tracks were taken out. That created the opportunity because of the widened curb to curb wide of way for the pull in parking. The pull in parking has always been thought to enhance the viability of the businesses, but now we seem to be entering an era where a lot of people are going to tell us to 
remove some of those parking spaces for additional things. So where do you start? I mean, how do you do this in a fair and balanced way? Lindsay, I think you probably started more than I have. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I think like it feels like the immediate first step, especially with parking, is to put in more planning time into the existing parking lots um, or and not even planning time, but working with those property owners really seeing because, again, you know, as an outsider, you guys may have answers to this already that I don't know, but, you know, that what are the barriers for those property owners to make those parking spaces more inviting? Because if they aren't, this is the thing, right? Is like, there are plenty of spots, most likely, most of the time, you know, and different days of the week. But if they're not being used and people feel put upon if a parking spot is taken away outside of those public parking lots, right? Um, you can understand that because they're not wanting to park in these these places that maybe feel unsafe. So I know that one really stood out to me because it feels like that's a real opportunity. You're talking you have, about the underground garage, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of yeah that lot. Um, and I, I so just in terms of offering parking alternatives, right? Like and looking at it like, oh, if we're taking this parking spot away for a parklet or for something else, public space wise, showing the alternative right away. Well, it's not just that; it's this, right? But also, I think that ROI conversation and thanks, Patty, for asking the question about how you calculate that is an important one to put out. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean I yeah I think I think that's a huge opportunity. I think the other the other pieces in like where you start, I would really look at I think that community survey that um, sorry there's a siren going by um, that your previous presenters mentioned is a great one because I think you'll get at depending on how you design the survey and make sure you you know send it out far and wide and get as an equitable representation of the community as you can and start to inform you know if you're looking at keeping some of those COVID um, design strategies permanent, asking questions about that, seeing what people think so that you have data and you have some insight around some of those things. I think that's really important. Hey, Lindsay, one question that I have for you is, do you have any sort of more specifics on what San Francisco or some of these other um, cities have done? Um, one of the things that we're really interested in is we have had conversations with the council office and they are excited for us to come back and just provide, it, if nothing more, a general sense of here are ideas that we think are important. And I'd be just curious, like, how does that San Francisco ordinance work or any of the other ones that you've seen? How, how do they do that? Yeah, well, so for the San Francisco one, I can't speak specifically to that. What I can say is that they their stuff is really easy to find. <laughs> so if you want to do some research on that, they they just they have done so much work around specifically parklets, but um, you know, they they've looked at studying the like social impacts and the uh, certainly the economic impacts. So there's they've done some good work in proving all of those things. Um, in the legacy business ordinances, my understanding, and there's some burgeoning ones, I believe Chicago is looking at it. And I think, I mean, I'm sure people in LA, there are folks who are thinking about it, that basically there, there are a number of ways that can work, but that, you know, it's essentially incentivizing and rewarding in a way legacy businesses in staying where they are investing in the community because it isn't just about locating there right I would imagine that your legacy businesses have given back to the community in ways that maybe isn't caught or isn't uh, studied yet or isn't like you know the data isn't gathered from that um, so anyway those legacy business ordinances are essentially either incentivizing or um, like deferrals or, you know, uh, what do you call it? Like rent control, those kinds of things. So it's basically just trying to, to keep that bottom line tight, which especially now I know all business or most businesses are suffering because of COVID and have had to deal with that. And so you're dealing with that on top of your rising rents and other things that are already drivers for legacy businesses kind of being on the, on the edge of having to move out. One of you, um, go ahead, Howard. I'm sorry, I was just gonna say that question of where to start. I think you're 100% corner, uh, Beverly and Larchmont, where you have that one half block that, that has an alley and none of the others do. Uh, I think there's a half an alley somewhere. But yeah. <clears throat> that block with the alley at the 100% corner is the place to start because that's the best 
that's the best people the way for people to get around without going through all the neighborhoods that's adjacent to it it's the best way to make right hand turns and left hand turns um your medians are fine because they're i think your character of your street changes after that next block up and the medians are fine because it's not going to be as it's, it's a different sort of main it's a different sort of, of high street it's more office and i would i would dare say put more homes put more stuff uh, um uh, 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 along along the upper stories of that of the north end where the where the medians are but the the issue you have is the the, the the median turning lane throughout is just silly because it pushes everything out but you have to have it because of service you don't have a service lane so that center lane acts as probably your service lane for the rest of everywhere else where the trucks park and they're able to get it <clears throat> but you can manage that with time on side street on the sides of, of the travel lanes so if you focus on the 100 percent corner and squeeze the traffic in and let the business and the life come out at that 100 percent corner you can start there and start using those parking areas with the alley to um, uh, supplement um, um, access to this great great 100 percent corner i have one additional question before i uh open it up and see what all the comments and thoughts are, hopefully there are lots, which is that at one point, I think that one of you mentioned a notion called hyper-local amenities. And I'm kind of curious what you mean, meant by that and whether you think we have hyper-local amenities or whether there are hyper-local amenities that we should start thinking about. Yeah, that was that was in mind. Um, yeah, that so no, thanks for bringing that up. I yeah, I think Larchmont, I think you definitely do. I think so that just essentially means like amenities that are especially unique to that specific district. So clearly, I mean, your district is unique in a lot of ways in design and in the store um, mix that you already have. So when I was mentioning the idea of, you know, parklets or pedlets or public space uses, making opportunities for those hyper-local hyper amenities, it's basically creating more space for those kinds of things to uh, to happen, right? So like, I know you have a few, I think you have a bookstore that's, that's like uh, something that people travel to the neighborhood for, right? That's a, that's a hyper-local amenity. Um, and even though they might not need a parklet, having more people come to the district for potentially, you know, the outdoor dining or other things means that could be, you know, more foot traffic for the bookstore. Um, there was one thing I just wanted to point out because I think Patricia C, sorry, what was her last name, had a great point. She asked about when I was talking about the legacy business ordinances and talking about like rent incentives, basically, um, that yes, generally, so she said, wouldn't that be up to the landlords? So they're looking for higher and higher rent. Totally get your point. And thanks for the clarification. Or those ordinances, usually that kind of incentive would come from the city or come from public coffers and so the landlord wouldn't actually lose out on anything even though I mean we could get into that uh, but this kind of ordinance basically comes from that public fund so thanks for noting that so I think that what's critical there is that all city making at this point involves creative accounting between the public side and the private side and it may be more than this poor one little street can sort of spearhead throughout the city of Los Angeles, but it is interesting to consider that this could be a test bed for some ideas that could uh, potentially take root and work throughout the city of Los Angeles. Well, anyway, with that, I think it makes a lot of sense to open it up, see what other people are thinking about. Howard, um, not Howard, Gary, um, um, Heather, you've been looking at the comments and the questions. I'll turn it over to you. Um, first, uh, there's, they jump around a lot, but before we get to, if we can start with the 100% 100 corner that Howard mentioned, because there's a couple of comments about that, so we can clarify it for the people who are not reading. Sure. The 100% um, corner to me was Beverly and Larchmont, where um, that's the most traffic, that's the most intense, that's your most urban um, intersection, kind of like uh, down the street on, on Wilshire and, um, 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 how, why did I, uh, 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 Western, yeah, West. Wilshire and Western. It's where John is, where, right where John is. Got it. Um, 
the, there are a lot of there are a number of questions about uh, parking and encroachment, and I they seem to be implying the same thing, which is if we go too far and have too much outdoor parking, you know what happens to the parking, especially if they're not going to be using our our underground parking. How do we balance that? Well, that's the question, isn't it? <laughs> that's the the major one. I think you know it's going back to something that Howard said in his presentation about like uh, leaving the me first behind is is sacrificing some things like that. But I think, um, you know, it doesn't have to be in uh, totally altruistic. I think there, as we've talked about, some ways to demonstrate the economic impact of giving up a parking space for something else. Um, but I think I think I saw a comment in the, that made a good point, though, about you know, using parking spaces, if they all become dining, right, what happens to other amenities? And I think that's a really good point, because, you know, you do have a unique business mix. And that's something to really focus on maintaining in order to maintain that community led economic development, that it doesn't have to all be restaurants, nor do those spaces have to be outdoor dining. So I just appreciated that point she made. But Howard, it looks like you had Oh, I just going to say, if, if everything becomes, if every parking space becomes dining, then you're Paris. Yeah. You got a little bit of time before you get there. Paris yeah. wasn't built in a day. <laughs> true. true, true. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I, but it's a good point. You don't have to think about parklets just for dining either. They can be no. just kind of park That's space. Right. Yeah, totally. So it's, but I, I liked that point she brought up because I don't think I was clear on that in my presentation in that these parklets can be all kinds of things um, right. that can, can support more than one business at a time. They can support entrepreneurs, they can support, you know, just public gathering. So just think about the the myriad uses that um, that they can support there and not just the, the one kind of business. Yeah. And, and the thing though about parklets is it is a test case. You can remove them. Um, yep. The issue I have is with the big giant parking garage idea. Well, let's just build a big giant parking garage. Well, my neighborhood in North Park has done this. It worked, but the parking garage is empty. It's it's a it's a loser. Uh, financially and for parking because nobody really has to go to the fifth floor of the parking garage when there's parking spaces all along in the area. Um, and people um, and, and people are naturally um, uh, see that you know, and there's free spaces all over. And that's what you know drives them away from the parking garage. It's pay. But the parking garage is a big is a big financial burden that was just for looks and it worked, but it showed you that we really didn't need that parking and it's cost us a lot of time and money to do other things such as parks and plazas. Uh, if you wanna look it up, it's called North Park Main Street. They're part of the Main Street Association, the downtown uh, 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 business uh, improvement district and parking district built the garage with other monies and it still sits there, but now people are trying to repurpose it and it's only eight years old. Hmm. Um, Patty Carroll, if you're still here, can you unmute? Because you've got a couple of questions about north of uh, Beverly, and I don't know how many you've been answered or not. Oh, uh, yeah. I just thought that it would be interesting uh, if Lindsay and Howard could weigh in on how they think the north of Beverly, south of Beverly, could actually successfully um, be a more cons more successful continuation or transition better into each other. Uh, build more mixed use uh, infill projects up to five stories. Uh, well, it's interesting because there there is a, um, a five story TOC that is uh, being. Uh, suggested, but they're not interested in putting ground floor commercial. They're using uh, the ground floor for parking, which is really, really bad. <laughs> so that's that's well, deadly. Though, and that's, even though it this would be goes, a killer. Patricia, even though this goes beyond what we can probably achieve in this first flush exercise, City of Los Angeles is adept at requiring ground level retail in their community plan implementation overlays almost to a fault. So, you know, in the yeah. place where it makes sense to do it, 
it could certainly be um, required and the city of Los Angeles has lots of zoning tools that they're already doing that in certain areas of the city. But, but not in this project. No. Yeah. No, not in this project. But Howard, you were going to say something though. Oh, I was just going to say that, that that's, um, that's, you know, that's deadly. We all know better than that than doing the ground floor parking today. Okay. However, however, um, um, we are doing new things such as retail ready, um, uh, new building construction where the ground floor is can be retail in the future, but it allows for an interim residential or, or another uh, office, you know, less than retail use, but so that it gets built in this time. Um, that's a new thing that we're trying to do. Another thing we did wrong in San Diego was, was mandate retail all on every block in our mostly in our downtown and it, we forgot that there are a streets and b streets and the streets change as you turn the block and uh, i don't think you have to worry about that too much here because your blocks are so small and you're looking directly on on your main street but um you know not all streets are the same and i think the north end has a north end of your street has a different use could fit, you know function and, and character than beverly which is you know the the fun zone <laughs> Yeah, and one one way to sort of um, I think it it relates to a couple of these questions I see popping up, but and this is a longer term investment, so I know we're focused on shorter term. But thinking about wayfinding signage and how those those kinds of design interventions can signal through like visuals what the district is if you want that kind of um, that kind of connection, whether it's gateway. You know, I do I know you have some of that, so it's not like starting from scratch, but thinking through some of that, and I think. To to the point about parking too, signage can be really helpful in terms of you know marketing that like oh hey there are spots here or whatever. So think about a, thinking about like a signage um, menu basically could be something to think about long term in terms of creating transition and um, you know kind of keeping that district together, but also things like parking and and there's other things of course, but just and, on those two and things things like wayfinding and um, lighting um, and paving patterns. Um, uh, um, that costs money and a lot of that is generated from a parking district but you're as but but the parklets do generate more money than a park than a parking space mm -hmm. especially if your timing is is very um broad and i'm not exactly sure what the timing is on your area but you can generate more revenue for that stuff with the with the mix of uses in a parking space than just a car Mm -hmm. I'd like to say something about the, the parking structure because I saw a couple comments about that. It's owned by the city. I know that we had issues with lighting. I think that was addressed. Um, and we were working with uh, CD4 before, before the election on better signage because it, it's not obvious that there's parking on the bottom. So a lot of people think it's just that surface parking. So that's kind of one of the things that we were working on and then COVID happened and um, it, it, it just got, got away from everybody, but that's something that we will definitely revisit and make that signage a little more um, prominent so people do know that there's parking available below. But even so, people are hesitant to park below and it closes early, so it's not an option for evening. Okay. Um... Well, this is, is Ann, if Ann Rubin is still here, can you ask your question? Because this is interesting and we'd love to hear the expert's opinion. Ann? Oh, hi. Yeah, I think maybe I'm in a minority, but, and I've spent a lot of time in San Francisco too, but I've never actually really, I don't really enjoy eating next to the cars and I worry about the health effects. And I guess this is my personal feeling. I'm just wondering if the People uh, looking at the national scene have gotten some responses like that or have heard. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing that up, Anne. It's a, it's a great question. We get that all the time too. It's definitely something to think about. Um, and there are, you know, there are some, that's why I showed a couple different examples where some folks just aren't even, I mean, yes, of course, like the exhaust, fumes, gas, that's one thing, but there's also just the noise and that sort of thing. Some people just don't enjoy that. So there are, you know, other ways to sort of use those parking spaces, like those pedlets we kind of showed, right? Where like you use the sidewalk. Yeah, I thought the pedlet was really interesting. I'd never seen that before. Yeah, it's not super common yet. And it, you know, it's like, I've, I've seen it in a few places, but, um, and actually the, um, that, 
project in Great Falls. I know it's much smaller, much different than LA, but they do have a, an impact study on that. The Montana State University did an impact study on Pedlets, which was pretty, it's pretty interesting. But yeah, I mean, I think um, the other thing though with, with parklets, if they're well-designed, you can do like different kinds of blocking so that there is vegetation, there's other kinds of sort of structural blocking so that you, you minimize the effects of the the gas, but Howard, it looked like you had something. Like I was just going to say, and that's where, where you have the, the parklets really, you need to slow down. The, the existing condition street is not the same when you bring a parklet into it as a, as a car. And so there, there has to be a design um, response to that, that, you know, narrower turning radiuses, more stops, your mid block crossing that you already have, you know, the, the speed is what makes all the difference. And what's happening in New York is, in Boston is they're just eventually just closing the whole street after beginning with the streetery, they're just closing the whole street down, which is something you probably already do with your family fair. Just now do four of them and then do 12 of them and do 360 of them, you know, one day, so. Is that a real suggestion or a for very me? real? You know, I, I, what you're going to end up doing is coming to a shared street. The shared street concept is that, um, and, and Lindsay had, I think, some imagery of that idea that the shared street is, is a pedestrian first street. And the pedestrian, and it's so the pedestrians and the bike at that scale of eight miles an hour is the max. You see this in plazas. Um, Balboa Park has a shared street. If you drive through Balboa Park's Plaza de Panama, it's very slow and the pedestrians move through and the bicycles and everybody. But it's only for a block. I'm not saying your street has many different, your street, you're so fortunate. It's such, I can't, I can't believe it's a main street because it dead ends on the north side. It comes out of a, a single family historic residential on the other side. And then boom, you got this really great um, main street for about three, four good blocks, right? Um, what, a, what a marvel. It's, 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 it's not hard to, to, to think of that as a shared street where you still have to have trucks to service it in the mornings. You still have to have people coming through. But on the weekends, give it a shot. See how you do, especially in the summertime when being outdoors in, in, in Southern California is one of the greatest things in the world. Think of the rest of the nation as poor people everywhere else. Like Chicago, oh, uh, uh, exactly right, <laughs> Howard. <laughs> we can't do the things you guys can do. And uh, I know Halifax has those uh, Ped Street things that you mentioned as well. Halifax, Nova Scotia has a lot of those uh, uh, pedways that are in the in the street, which is very interesting uh, because it's just spill out. The, what is happening is the shops are all just spilling out all over the sidewalk. A, a yeah. few of us had conversations with the city a while ago about closing the middle of Larchmont from stop sign to stop sign and making it part of a a mall and outdoors and the city didn't want to do it because we had an accident here in Santa Monica years ago where a guy drove through and killed people and they said you got to close the entire street or none so yeah, I don't yeah and I don't see I, don't, I think you're not you're not urban enough you're not Paris you are only a hundred years old uh, maybe in change you need more time you need more people you can't cut off the car because that's how the majority of people are still getting to your place. You don't have the oomph of the people spilling out of their homes right behind it, getting into it. So you still need the car. It's just, you need to put the car in its place and the shift or while our memory is this fast, you know, street, our expectation is this more of a contemporary street where people and cars and bikes and transit are mixing now. Yeah, and I think Howard, oh, sorry, Gary, just oh, cool. one, one quick point. And Howard kind of kind of said it when he said, try it out, right? Like we've had a lot of communities across the country trying out open streets experiments for weekends, right? In the summer, especially. And, but they, when they took the idea to their city governments, it's like, we are gonna do surveys after each event and we're gonna see what the response has been. They started off with one weekend. This was a community in North Carolina, smaller, of course, but still. And they did a survey afterward, both like an intercept survey with paper and also an online survey and found that people loved it. And so they repeat, they ended up expanding the program for every weekend over the summer and they closed it off after the summer, but there was some real um, opportunity there because they gathered that data. And you may find that, you know, that might be different in Larchmont, but at least you try something that maybe be, that could be low intervention to just 
see how the concept and, works. And you can do that with the bike lanes. Just try yeah. a temporary bike lane on one block and see how it works. Try shifting something. You know, you have a sunny side and a shady side of that street because it's north south. Have try something on the sunny side that's different from the shady side. Um, uh, John can help you with those design interventions on those frontages that would make things exciting. Um, Sorry. Uh, Patty Lombard, you had a question. You might as well ask it yourself about how to balance the interest between hyper local and more generally local. You want to just... uh, yeah, I'm just picking up on some things that other people are putting in the chat about the um, the neighborhood amenities that aren't exactly just this neighborhood that people come from around um, the community, and that's a good thing for our small businesses. We we, we are really excited about that, but we also are thinking, you know, how would you make sure that when we survey that we survey correctly? Maybe there's some best practices on surveys that you could guide us to um, that would help us really reach out to people. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I it's the answer isn't as easy as, uh, but generally we encourage folks to have different platforms for people to take their survey on. So it could be an intercept survey. It could be a quick like iPad survey, like an intercept survey, either with paper or like a quick iPad survey they could take, but to identify where they're coming from. Because I think even folks from out of the community can, can offer a really important opportunity for the community to make the case for those type of local amenities in that if people are coming from another neighborhood because Larchmont has something specific that they want, that means that that business is important, not just to the community, which is already enough, but that it's it's like impact is, is wider, I guess. So if you, it's not a bad thing to include some of those folks from outside in the surveys. It's just a matter of, yeah, that outreach. So yes, I mean, I think with online surveys, that's also something that you know, if you have different partners in the community that they can share out with their listservs. But even beyond that, if you have, um, like if you know that people who are coming into your neighborhood, it's mostly from your neighborhoods around you, working with those neighborhood associations or anybody else who might be the point people there to share with their listservs, just making sure that the survey has that question, like where, you know, where are you located so that you can use that data to sort of explore what that impact is. Okay, I'll, I'm, a lot of the, <clears throat> sorry, a lot of the questions still are going back to north versus the south, and I'm not sure we, our experts can answer that one. I think a lot of it is just local uh, questions. I'm trying to see what. Well, we I think they've offered a bunch of different ideas already. I mean, I think what I've heard Howard say is acknowledge the fact that the north block is different than the center block, which is different than the south block, and to some extent, what I think Howard's implying is that you may have different strokes for different folks that somehow still integrate with each other. Mm -hmm. So the type of curbside management program that you do in the center may not be exactly the same as what you do north of there. And that, you know, we have to have some sort of sense of flexibility and adaptability based upon the local circumstance. I also heard Howard and I think Lindsay nodded her head up and down. I think both of them have, have made some suggestions about mixed use to the north there, um, bringing more people to the street. So I think there are some thoughts that have been, that they've both contributed to the conversation. Maybe you'd like to clarify and frame those even more, Howard. Well, i just say that the conflict is this, the lack of an alley and you have that service alley, that service lane on that one block. And that's just such a, um, that's so helpful. And so focusing on that block first is probably your is probably the most bang for your buck right now. And then and then as I said, test it and work it out. Um, how does the north side, you know, uh, in five years, if the if the if the retail and the and the dining and the outdoor shopping amenities on the, the Beverly side, what does that mean up there? Can you can you put more parking and more, um, you know, can there can that be more of 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 a help to the 100% corner idea, or as you're saying, and I agree with you, it's just a different place. The, the street changes character, medians, trees, it's different, it's quieter, it's just, it's more live. It's more livable than thriving like the other one. So um, I think that's up to you all, y'all can do that. You got it, you've been looking at it for decades. 
Okay, uh, Jane Usher, if you'd like to unmute and go for it. So here I am, thanks, Jerry, thanks, gang. Um, I wanted to talk about how we curate the optimal mix of uses. Living here 30 years, as many on the call have, I've noticed that the neighborhood serving uses, the Finkley neighborhood serving uses have given way. We've got lots more restaurants, coffee places, um, food takeout places. And you've heard people talk, the grocery store is gone, the post office is gone, the hardware store is gone, uh, the bookstore mercifully remains, the hairdressers are gone. <laughs> um, so what's the, the tool or the mechanism for curating the right mix? Yeah, no, I appreciate that question, Jane. That's something that, um, and I won't, I won't belabor this too much, but it's something that we do a lot of at Main Street America. It's one of our primary kind of field service work. We look at a number of different data sources to pull together to look at what we call transformation strategies in like figuring out retail gaps in business mix. So we look at things like Esri data, which is, you know, it's imperfect for those of you who know about data and use it, uh, fully understand that, but there's some psychographic data, meaning like behavioral um, background information about folks. We do community surveys, we do stakeholder meetings with different folks in, involved in different ways in the community, both like, you know, um, civic leaders, business owners, residents, et cetera. And we take all of those inputs to kind of, and of course, like a business inventory to see, okay, what are the gaps here? What are people asking for? What are there too many of? What would, you know, what uh, would be the ideal use for this kind of space? So, you know, looking at, um, it's what I mentioned with the business inventory in my remarks is that, you know, looking at spaces that are available or vacant spaces or may have, you know, um, opportunities for kind of like co-location or pop-ups. So a long way of saying that there are ways to, um, to define what retail gaps there are and what the, the market is asking for. If you take a number of different data sources together and kind of look at what the opportunities, that's a longer and sort of more intensive process. I know there are there are other ways to do it, but that's generally, um, that's a lot of the work that we do with our communities is really doing a deep dive, like data analysis, but also a lot of community engagement in defining you know what people what people need. And then looking at that and saying, okay, and then how do we recruit those businesses or how do we try to uh, get existing businesses to offer some of the services that are missing? Um, so that's kind of a long-winded way of saying it, but it's it can be complicated, but it's doable. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, Jane, I, I would just like to say, though, that every Main Street in every community in every city is dealing with what you just said. Um, um, work has changed tremendously since COVID. We are all now able to work from home in the way that we never thought of before. So you're going to see business and the way we do, way we do work uh, change on your main street. Um, you also, post offices and large format retail are becoming delivery. And, and, and we know that the delivery mechanism has changed shopping and retailing. And as you all talked about the last meeting, tremendously. I would just say too that the tenants you're getting are the tenants that you deserve, that you that fit, that see you know that see the marketplace. Because what you're seeing is eating and dining has really really become our public social gathering. It's a very commercialized, capitalistic way of town making now because that's where we are. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little disappointed, if you can tell by my tone, that that's what we've become. Um, like the greatest innovation in retail was is the to-go drink. And you're not going to put that genie back in the bottle, pun intended. Um, um, but, the, you know, that, that's the biggest shift and change in retailing in our main streets. Um, we can do better, we can do more. Um, and I think, really think it comes down to you know, public spaces, public life, and the things that John talked about at the beginning. But Howard, could you take that one step further though? Because in, the, in your presentation, you talked about the cultural and the social. 
And you talked about basically the frameworks that you need to concentrate on, which if you concentrate on them and they're in the street, will have a tendency to reshape to a certain degree the stuff that's in the storefronts next to yeah. the street. That's right. And, and, I, and I think that that's a really sort of interesting and counterintuitive um, point that you're making. I mean, in some ways, it, it, it's like it's a chicken and egg argument. And it's it's age old in, 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 in downtowns and main streets, like which comes first, the perfect retailer or the investment that somehow convinced the perfect retailer that it was worth investing the extra money on what might be an expensive street. And, and I, I'm not sure that one or the other is right, but I'd be curious for you to elaborate a bit more on that social cultural phenomenon and the making of main streets. Um, yes, um, I, I, I do agree. The, the point is, is that by allowing for a temporary testing um, um, incubator of uses and letting them succeed or or fail and then making it able to change them is so much uh, better for our um, austere economic moment than doing that one big garage, building that one, requiring that one giant grocery store. Because with that fails, you have to do so much work and so much effort to undo that. Um, so I would hope that you could think of a linear farmer's market in your in your parklets, in your parkways, and that that farmer's market in the marketplace on both sides of the walkway that is different from the other side of the of the uh, where the drive where the drive travel lanes are. You could create a festival marketplace along your sidewalk, and then that can tell you what what's the shops, and that can tell you what's being bought and sold. And 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 my point is just that you can buy so much of this stuff online. That's the um, services, a tailor, the the hat maker the you know the, the whatever that saying is the tailor the cheese maker the hat maker thing um all that is this change it shifted so much that really it's just now eating and drinking and having fun um because we all want to be so social that's how we socialize today um but i think you can test things and see does the cheese maker make it here to go with your wine shop next to your bookstore probably you know what, what, what does a does a does a seating area with trees and shading and you know, a, a pleasant place to be outside, work with your bookshop, your cheese maker and your, and your wine store. Yeah, probably, you know, trust, test it out and try it out and then fill in those parking. There's a lot of fill in this area. You're only working on your second generation of buildings. And that first generation of buildings is century old, didn't have any, you know, central heat and air is all post and beam stuff. This second generation of the storefronts are now being, oh, I'm sorry, you know, you're in your third generation. Right now is the third generation building coming in. And that third generation building is the, the future's unwritten. Like, why can't you uh, make it work for you based upon testing over the next five years of what this, what this place really can hold? Um, Lindsay, I wanted to thank you for answering questions online. Makes our job easier. Um, there's one thing that's sort of shown up in different versions is the idea of a survey in terms of what we know about the, who's, who's using it, you know, local versus uh, long distance and who's parking and who's walking. And you, you mentioned that you guys do surveys. Is it economically feasible for us as a community to get a survey that would be practical, that would really give us the information we need? And how do we go about doing that? Great question. Yes. Uh, yeah, it is. We generally, when we do our online surveys, we either use a tool called SurveyMonkey, which many of you have probably used, and that does have a fee to uh, to host. It's generally worth it. I think it does pretty good um, and interesting analysis and visuals for the data. But I mean, you could even do um, a Google form. And that would be free. It's basically like you could even iterate that, right? We iterate the survey tools to kind of see what what works. Um, but there there are a number, I think, of of free tools or low cost tools. And I, I it's like Survey Monkey is one of those that you hear the name and you're like, wow, they're still in business. But they actually they've improved their their development and it's it's pretty good. You can find kind of low cost ones, but you could always try it with a free a free um, platform like Google. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. It looks like all the topics have been covered, unless I'm missing something. If anyone wants to, do we have the raise your hand feature <laughs> available? That's right. Well, I like Heather's last comment that she made here. It might be worth okay. using that as a sort of exit strategy for the conversation because it's okay. a really interesting point, which is maybe Heather, you want to put pose it in the form of a question because I think it's phenomenally interesting. Well, I think, you know, I've, as I said in the last meeting, I've been coming to Larchmont my whole life. I've lived here for probably more than 20 years now, and I've seen the neighborhood change. And um, And I think one of the great things about Larchmont is that we are so many different generations living with each other. I actually, you know, I'm, I'm now in my 50s, and I... I see a lot of younger people in their 30s and moving in, and we all kind of see the neighborhood serving uses as different. Like I personally see another more restaurants as neighborhood serving, but but some of my other neighbors uh, may not see that. They would rather see a hair salon or a post office, or we just all have different um, definitions of what serves the neighborhood. So I was just curious if in your experience, you had any um, experience in, in dealing with this. I'm sure this happens in many communities across the country. I could take a crack at it. No, I, that's a great question. And it's such a, I hope that you look at that as uh, like, it's unique and special in that that means that the opportunity to meet the needs of a you know of a community member there are maybe more options there um but i think and i hate to keep going back to data sources i'm not a total data wonk y'all uh but i do think it's important when you're iterating to to track some of this but i think you know it's important this is where community engagement becomes really important this kind of stuff that you all are trying to do so that you get a you know a young person who maybe is um, you know maybe it's a dual income household maybe they don't have any kids so they have more of an income to Howard's point here in the chat that you may have an aging you know a household of aging folks whose incomes have fallen but if they're in the same sort of um, community engagement process or conversation to kind of understand like, I really wish there was a hardware store here. And the other person says, oh, well, you know, I just buy my stuff online. It's like one isn't more important than the other or more indicative of what needs to happen. It's just uh, kind of, you know, it's a preference, but I think for folks to understand the different reasons why, you know, the hardware store might've gone out of business or why that happened um, and kind of thinking what might, might fit in instead. Um, but I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a corny answer, but I think the bottom line is that community engagement. I think having a diverse community is what we should all strive for. And it just, it makes your all's job as kind of the conveners and the point people for this kind of conversation all the more important in getting an equitable representation of your community to the table to discuss this kind of stuff and see each other's points of view. I, I think that that is really one of the main reasons why we're doing this is so that we can't, so that everybody can be heard. And I think that, I think that we all agree that the one thing that we love and value about Larchmont is that it's so special and it has this small town feel in the big city. And I think we all want to protect that. At, but at the same time, we don't want to be um, uh, left behind. <laughs> So it's, it's just that balance of, of protecting our, our small town vibe, yet recognizing that people want high-end shopping and dining at the same time. So that, that balance of, of that is something that I think all of us here are, are seeking to do, at least I think. Somebody can raise their hand if, I'm, if they disagree. Howard, can you, uh, your last comment is so interesting. If people are not reading the chat, um, sort of a your generalization. And your last sentence said, it might be worth trading off street parking for historic preservation. Well, my and point was Patricia made a great point that people, the charm today is that it's not a contemporary modern city. Um, but a century ago, it was. It was state of the art. It had streetcars, it had a bungalow type of home, which had never existed before. Um, it had, um, it was made by, you know, it was assembled on site with electric tools. And, and so it was the beginning of modernism or industrialization. Um, 
and um, and so um, um, the whole area um, mostly has changed um, uh, on the main street more than in the neighborhood. And you have a tremendous uh, uh, historic neighborhood district around it. And I think if you, it, it, and that was something we did here in North Park when we did our community plan update. We worked with the local historic preservation groups to say, if we touch your neighborhood, if we touch the neighborhoods off of the main street, can we do mixed use walkable urbanism on the corridors? Yes, okay, that's the trade-off. I think you need to make that trade-off here because you don't have a significant historic um, presence on Larchmont as much as you do the neighborhood. So. Um, maybe it, it, understanding we want to preserve this, we might have to trade this off to get there. And the, make, the trade offs we make are, are narrow enough where you can get consensus among, across the board that this is, maintains our charm. This is why we're here. This is what we love about it. We're not here to scrape and you know, slash and burn. We're here to build and, and, and stay alive. Because the worst thing you can do is just put yourself under glass and and stop any change because you will lose revenues and you will really be in trouble. Then you're gonna have to let somebody else is gonna come in and plan it for you because you don't have any standing because you've lost all of your revenues. You've lost all of your uh, ability to, to change and keep up with change. John, that sounds like a conclusion to me. That does. So let me just share my, my screen for just a moment and try to um, wrap this because We've had a moderated discussion. We've had a open discussion with a lot of really interesting points and taking our conversation one step further. In terms of next steps, we are, well, first of all, before we go to the next steps, I wanna thank Howard and Lindsay for their contribution. You, you've managed to present some subjects that I know for us are controversial in part for the reasons that Heather started to bring up, which is that we have different generations of people with, and we have lots of folks who with different ideas and, and we're all looking for a way to get there, but we needed to open ourselves up to hearing what some people thought who didn't have a direct um, stake in the game in order to maybe further our conversation. So you've done that both brilliantly tonight. You've given us all lots of stimulus as to places we might look at and research areas we might delve into, confidence in terms of producing a survey using SurveyMonkey. I, by the way, have SurveyMonkey, we pay for it, so we can use ours if you wanna use ours. And um, so I just can't thank you enough for taking the time, especially you, Lindsay, since you must be ready to fall asleep right now. Anyway, <laughs> in terms of next steps on July 26th, um, is that the right date, friends, two weeks from now? Did I do that right? <laughs> yes, I did. Gary's nodding his head up and down. I can't see Patty right now. We're going to have what we're calling right now an ideas workshop, and that will really be an opportunity for everyone to get together once again on Zoom. We're going to have to figure out how to do this and facilitate this to um, just put every idea we can think of on the table. No biases walking into it. Um, if anybody's heard anything they absolutely don't like, we want to know that as well. It's kind of like a survey in a workshop over the course of an hour and a half, two hours. And then what we're going to try to do is take all of those ideas. We have a emergent, larger group of people that we're trying to pull together to filter through all of this and basically figure out what the opportunities are for the short term. And, and while we're interested in the midterm and the long term as well, we really do want to make sure that this conversation has something that comes out of it that we can either take directly to the community, take to the council office, take to the bid, to the Boulevard Association, and see something happen, see the power of our voices and the power of our organizing. So based upon that, we really hope that you'll join us on the 26th. We hope that you'll participate when we do do some type of a survey, um, look for the ideas coming forward, keep going back every once in a while to WW Larchmont 2021, where Patty is religiously organizing resources, updates and register. And, and as we said at the very beginning, if there's something you wanna say, we'll compile all these comments, but if you haven't said it, and you still want to say it or feel like it's a better form to say it one-to-one, -one, 
send Patty at patty at larchmontbuzz.com an email, and we will learn about your ideas on a one-to-one -one basis. So with that, we'll see you on the 28th. Six. The 26th, yes, ignore that, the 28th. And uh, thank you, thank you, Howard and Lindsay again, and good night. Thank you all.